The following is part of Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series under the Cornell East Asia Program. The arguments and viewpoints of this talk belong solely to the speaker. We hope you enjoy. Thank you all for coming. So as Josh mentioned, um, my background, my previous research is on wealthy entrepreneurs in the city of Chengdu in Sichuan province in China. And let me just give you a little bit of background on this particular research topic. And basically, the growing interest in Tibetan Buddhism among my previous research informants, who are mostly wealthy business people and some government officials, is what led me to, this, to conduct this research. Um, and there was one incident in particular that basically put me over the edge and said, I've got to come back and do research on this. So a friend of mine in Chengdu owns several car dealerships. And he told me that these um, businessmen kept showing up with Tibetan llamas and purchasing expensive SUVs for them in the hope that this would protect their businesses and uh, protect them in the recent anti-corruption campaign. So after I heard that story, I thought, all right, I got to come back and do research on this topic. Um, so I should emphasize that I approach this topic as an anthropologist of contemporary Chinese society, not as a scholar of Tibetan Buddhism. So it, this has been a quite, quite challenging research for me because I'm not a scholar of Tibet uh, or Tibetan Buddhism. Um, the talk today is based on uh, six months of research I did, mostly in 2014 and 2015. This, still, this project is still ongoing. I'm still writing up a lot of my research, so uh, I would appreciate any feedback you have, any comments. So let me just give you a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about today. I mean, this is a, a huge phenomenon that we could approach from many different angles. And I'm just going to fo focus on a few highlights today. Um, I want to begin by talking about the kind of broader ecology of belief and morality in post-Mao China. And I, I use this term post-belief society to talk about China. So, um, and I think this is really crucial to understanding the appeal of Tibetan Buddhism in, in uh, contemporary China. Um, I then want, want to talk about, given this con ideolo broader ideological context, why is it that Tibetan Buddhism is perceived as such a potent source of moral authority? Um, I'll then talk a little bit about the structure of these communities of practitioners, some of the tensions between them. Um, I'll talk about how this phenomenon is a gendered phenomenon. Um, the vast majority of, of serious participants, serious practitioners are women. And I'll posit a few explanations as to why this is the case. Um, and then I'll end talking about a recent scandal involving um, the ordination of a well-known Chinese actor, Zhang Tailin, who was ordained as a, a reincarnated lama. And I'll look at some of the both popular and official reactions to this incident. And I'll uh, draw some implications for how we think about uh, charisma in contemporary China. Actually, let me just leave it on there. All right, so let me begin with a brief portrait of a man I met midway through my field work in 2015 at a tea house popular with wealthy Buddhists. Mr. Zhang came from a small village in a mountainous part of Sichuan province and worked as a long distance truck driver for several years. Driving trucks put him into contact with the criminal underworld and he abandoned trucking to pursue a more lucrative career as an enforcer for a powerful gang in a small city outside of Chengdu. He moved up the ranks and was soon in charge of his own crew of thugs who specialized in high interest loans and debt collection. After his gang became involved in a murder, he fled to a Tibetan town in the highlands of western Sichuan province to avoid police scrutiny. As he recounted to me, while, while he was there, he was haunted by vivid recurring dreams of violence and images of blood. On the advice of a local Tibetan, he met with a lama at the local monastery who advised him to repeatedly recite the mantra, O Mani Be Me Hong. This marked the beginning of his encounter with Tibetan Buddhism. And when I met him several years after his meeting with the lama, he had given up loan sharking entirely, renounced violence, and devoted himself to full-time Buddhist study, regularly attending classes organized by the Bodhi Society, the Puti Shui Hui. And I'll talk a little bit more about this organization in a moment. Mr. Zhang also encouraged his semi-retired gangster friends to start engaging in good deeds, such as handing out money to street sweepers and janitors. But he emphasized you can't give money to beggars because he said they're all fake. Um, and Mr. Zhang, I should mention also, Mr. Zhang had an interesting transition from being a loan sharker to being a full-time Buddhist practitioner because when he returned from this Tibetan town, 
Lots of people still owed him money, but he had renounced violence. So I asked him, well, how do you collect a debt uh, without the threat of violence? And he explained that he would uh, give uh, the, the people who owed him money a lecture about the principle of karma. And I said, well, how effective was this? He said, it was not effective. I lost a lot of money. <laughs> um, but by the time I met him, he was a, a full-time uh, Buddhist practitioner. Mr. Zhang frequently made bold declarations about China and his government. And I want to begin with a quote from Mr. Zhang that encapsulates the often bleak characterization of Chinese society shared by many of the Buddhist practitioners in my research. And here I quote, because no one believes in anything in this country, all that is left to guide them is greed, tanxin. All that it will take to turn this country around will be for people to really study traditional culture and religion. If they do this, China will turn around in 10 years. If they don't do this, then China is doomed. Echoing the sentiment of Mr. Zhang, intellectuals, netizens, and many ordinary Chinese often reference a perceived spiritual or moral crisis to explain everything from food safety scandals to the pervasiveness of corruption in China. In the aftermath of early reformers and Communist Party campaigns against religion, the Cultural Revolution, the failure of the June 4th student movement, and in the wake of the incessant economic boom of the past few decades, pragmatism and materialism would appear to trump faith in any ideological system, be it religious or political. Many Chinese in the post-Mao reform era assert that they are without beliefs, implicitly comparing themselves to Western societies considered by them to be anchored in Judeo-Christian values. In this context, in the context of this perceived moral breakdown, many Chinese view themselves as actively searching for a model or framework of belief and morality and have turned to diverse spiritual traditions to provide them with an ethical template or, uh, for both guiding themselves and measuring others. Given that there's no single moral authority in China, the anthropologist Yan Yunxiang has compared this to a supermarket approach to ethics, in which different options are chosen to justify different courses of action. The rise and fall of the Qigong movement in the 80s and 90s, the explosive growth of Christianity in many cities in China, renewed interest in traditional Chinese medicine and body cultivation practices, and the spread of Tibetan Buddhism among Han Chinese which will be the focus of this talk, have all emerged from this milieu. This so-called moral vacuum or spiritual crisis presupposes a context in which the major ideals of the Maoist years, selflessness, sacrifice, cooperation, equality, and frugality, are widely discredited as naive, overly idealistic, or unscientific. As Suzanne Brandstetter argues, in the context of post-Mao materialism, Maoist political cosmology no longer offers a viable framework for assessing the worth or intentions of others. She states, quote, the post-Mao state can no longer provide a tool to probe appearances, resolve contradictions, and reveal the true value of persons and social relations, unquote. Over the past several decades, the capacity to generate money has perhaps emerged as the most stable measure of value for assessing the, the worth of oneself and others. Self-interest, materialism, calculation, and treachery are often assumed to be the taken-for-granted dispositions of strangers. A recent survey found that fewer than one in five people in China believe that the majority of Chinese people are trustworthy, and less than three in 10 believe that strangers can be trusted. Post-Mao attempts by the Communist Party to promote ideals such as the harmonious society and the eight glories and eight shames, ba rong ba chi, of the Hu Jintao years or more recent nostalgic campaigns promoting the virtue of self-sacrifice, such as the resurrection of Lei Feng as a symbol of sacrificial devotion to others, are typically met with cynicism or ironic ridicule. And just to give you an example, there was a recent biopic of uh, Lei Feng, and at the premiere, the movie premiere in Nanjing, zero tickets were sold on opening day. So not exactly uh, succeeding in official propaganda. Haiyan Li argues in her recent book on stranger sociality in China, that state administering and manufacturing of morality through such campaigns have served to undermine rather than promote morality towards strangers not encompassed by kinship ethics. Citing the Leifeng campaign as an example, she argues that, quote, state attempts to reward do-gooders via bureaucratic channels have had the damning effect of diminishing their moral charisma 
and inviting cynical imputations of careerism, unquote. Because state attempts to promote systems of belief and morality are met with cynicism, I argue that they contribute to the very phenomenon they seek to address, undermining the moral authority of the state in the process. So this begs the question, what, if anything, has filled the post-Mao ideological vacuum? The anthropologist Yan Yunshang has argued that the Maoist state destroyed the kin-based moral fabric of Chinese society through its attacks on filial authority and collectivization campaigns. While the class-based ethics of Maoism in some ways took its place, the state then retreated in the early 80s, dismantling the belief system it had been promoting for decades, resulting in an ideological vacuum that was quickly filled by the values of late capitalism and global <coughs> consumerism. This transformation provided fertile ground for the growth of what Yen dubs the uncivil individual, who feels fewer obligations and duties toward the community and other individuals, and thus has lost much of his or her civility." Unquote. So this just kind of gives you an overview of this. And I put this in question mark, because I'm not, I'm not completely comfortable with this notion of ideological void. But um, Yin's claim is echoed by many ordinary Chinese, who often understand post-Mao China to be stuck in a state I call post-belief, in which not only does no one believe in anything, no one is capable of believing in anything. Scholars and ordinary Chinese alike point to the endless cycle of purges and counter-purges of the Maoist era, the ideology-driven violence of the Cultural Revolution, and the rampant materialism of post-92 China, as all contributing to engender a profound cynicism and skepticism towards any belief system. <coughs> Thus, for many, a kind of cynical market individualism is the quote-unquote truth that Maoism and other belief systems deny. Even government officials who publicly articulate commitment to official ideas rooted in bettering society are widely assumed to be the most cynical and unbelieving of all groups. So I'm almost a Tibetan Buddhism. My apologies for the overly long introduction. However, few in China seem to accept loss of belief as a normal and healthy state of affairs. The phrase, Chinese people have no beliefs, repeated in countless conversations I've had in China, has been offered to explain everything from the hedonistic excesses of the new rich to the dishonest business practices of shopkeepers. Among my businessman informants in my previous research, drinking, gambling, consumerism, and womanizing were often seen as clear symptoms of having no beliefs. I suggest, of course, that we should not take these assertions of lack of beliefs at face value, but rather should view them as one of the interpretive frames through which many Chinese have attempted to make sense of the profound transformations of post-Mao society. Furthermore, this backdrop of a cynical world provides a useful frame for claiming moral distinction in a context in which everyone is presumed to be governed by self-interest alone. In what many Chinese view as an amoral post-belief society, claims that one is acting out of morality, compassion, or belief carry a great deal of force and legitimacy. Claims of belief and morality have become a way of generating distinctions within and between social groups and of, and of positioning oneself as a moral subject above the fray of crude self-interest and as an upholder of principle in an unscrupulous world. This, the, this context in which state-promoted ideologies and institutions have little moral authority and in which credible sources of moral authority are in many ways competing for one another, com contending with one another, is crucial to understanding the appeal of Tibetan Buddhism among middle-class Chinese in the PRC. Among the Buddhist devotees that I came to know, perhaps the primary source of Tibetan Buddhism's appeal was its impeccable moral authority. It was one institution which they believed not to be permeated by cynicism. They were utterly certain that the Tibetan monks and lamas they encountered truly believed and were not motivated by some ulterior motive. Many Han Chinese have their first direct encounter with Tibetan Buddhism as tourists on trips to Tibetan regions where they witness Tibetan Buddhist pilgrims engaging in repeated, repeated prostrations in front of temples and other holy sites. They're often struck by the faith of these the faith of these pilgrims, who appear to the often jaded Chinese tourists as utterly sincere in their belief. Many return from their trip with a new set of stereotypes of Tibetans. Prior to their travels, many Chinese tourists' ideas of Tibet were largely informed by official propaganda and popular stereotypes which portrayed Tibetans as savage, backward, and uncivilized. 
Several Buddhist converts I knew, however, spoke of Tibetans as being happy and worry-free, a state they attributed to their Buddhist belief. Many followers, especially in their initial encounter with Tibetan Buddhism, hope to appropriate or achieve the happy state they project upon Tibetans. One follower who first encountered Tibetan Buddhism as a tourist remarked to me that she was struck by the smiles on the faces of Tibetans, despite their apparent poverty, which challenged her assumptions about material success and happiness. She explained, quote, I came to realize that the smiles of movie stars are ugly and fake, but those of Tibetans are real. When I asked devotees why they were drawn to Tibetan Buddhism and not to Chinese Buddhist traditions or other religions, my interviewees frequently cited the impurity and degradation of Chinese Buddhist monasteries. They asserted that, that most important teachings were lost during the Cultural Revolution or that the Communist Party and market forces had irrevocably damaged monastic life in Han areas. Many claimed that despite the devastation brought by the Cultural Revolution on Tibetan monasteries, Tibetan Buddhism had emerged more or less intact from this period because in the words of one follower, quote, the important doctrines and teachings were in the monks' minds and were transmitted orally. Others expressed negative stereotypes about Chinese monks, no doubt fed by recent financial and sex scandals involving high-ranking monks and abbots at Chinese Buddhist temples. Several followers claimed that Chinese monks lacked su zhi, or which we can understand as personal quality, arguing that Chinese only become monks due to their poverty and lack of other options to support themselves. Some practitioners contrasted the background of Chinese monks with those of Tibetan monks, claiming that Tibetan families, quote, send their best sons to become monks, and thus tended to possess higher suja or quality than their Chinese counterparts. The moral authority associated with Tibetan Buddhism tends to be embodied in charismatic monks, kempo, or reincarnated lamas, referred to in Chinese as huofo, or in Tibetan as tuku. The Buddhists I knew typically began their engagement with Tibetan Buddhism by undergoing a conversion ceremony, <coughs> gui yi, administered by their soon-to-be guru, or shang shi, although sometimes they later switched to gurus that they per perceived to be more powerful or efficacious. So this is, um, so a lot of these uh, activities, you know, are happening in private apartments in Chinese cities. So technically, you know, these are illegal religious gatherings, but they tend to be relatively small in scale. So um, here a group of Han Chinese followers were, um, you know, uh, went, underwent a, an official kind of conversion ceremony. They issued a little certificate, a gui yi zheng, a sort of certificate of, of conversion. And they become disciples of a particular uh, teacher who they refer to as shang shi. In a context of widespread distrust, Followers of a single lama or kempo. So kem for those of you who are not familiar with Tibetan Buddhism, uh, kempo is sort of the highest uh, degree of learning in the Nyingma tradition of the Nyingma sect of Buddhism. In the context of widespread distrust, followers of a single lama or kempo constituted an instant moral community. They joined WeChat groups organized around their teacher and referred to their fellow devotees as their shishung, uh, which would be disciples of the same teacher. One of the first requests from Han followers to their Tibetan teacher is to be granted a Tibetan Dharma name, a Fa Ming. And many followers use Chinese transliterations of their Tibetan uh, Dharma name as their WeChat account name. And there's this kind of, this is one example of a sort of broader uh, appropriation of Tibetanness that I found among many of the Chinese practitioners of Tibetan Buddhism. So this is a, a, a Chinese woman who, um, going on a pilgrimage, to a Tibetan monastery who, go, who um, made a point to dress up in sort of traditional Tibetan dress. Wealthy practitioners donate apartments that serve as informal sites for study and sermons, as well as residences for out-of-town followers. On their online forums, more experienced practitioners answered questions about Buddhist doctrine and, and how to apply it to their daily lives. Because they trusted their fellow practitioners, they also turned to them for advice on everything from stock tips to courses of medical treatment. They were quick to lend each other money and trustful that money they gave their fellow disciples to make an offering on their behalf would not be embezzled or misappropriated. One Buddhist follower's bank manager husband, who'd been dismissive of her Buddhist belief, 
became supportive of her when he learned that followers don't ask for receipts when they donate money to their guru or give money to other followers on their behalf. He declared, that kind of trust is really rare in China today. In addition to sharing advice and helping direct their offerings, practitioners frequently hosted fellow practitioners from out of town when they came to meet their guru. Since many prominent Tibetan lamas spend their winters in Chengdu, lay followers from Shanghai, Guangzhou, and other eastern cities frequently travel to Chengdu just to attend a single meeting or empowerment hosted by their teacher. These groups would eat together in high-end vegetarian restaurants, sometimes hosting their guru, other times simply gathering together with other uh, disciples from around the country. Conspicuous in these banquets was the absence of meat, alcohol, or smoking, which was both for, for, forbidden in most of these restaurants and generally shunned by followers as well. And uh, so I meant to pause for a moment just to give you a little bit of background on the, the prominent lamas uh, that, that have the largest number of Han Chinese followers. So um, prob the two lamas I would say that have the largest Han followings, and it, I hesitate to estimate how many numbers, are um, Kempo Sodarige Rinpoche and uh, Toldrum Lordo. And both of them are students of Jingmei Punsok, who was the founder of the most important uh, Buddhist academy and monastery in this whole story. And this is uh, Larungar, uh, so Larong Wuming Fo Shui Yuan in Sida County in Sichuan province. So this was founded in 1980 by Jingmei Punsok. Um, and one of the sort of key moments in the spread of Tibetan Buddhism to Han Chinese areas is when Jigme Punsok travels to Wutaishan in Shanxi province on a pilgrimage. And there he attracts several uh, Chinese followers who follow him back to Larungar. And so um, as some of you might be aware, this um, it's hard to see from a distance, but all these little red dots essentially are um, the dwellings of either monks, nuns, or uh, lay practitioners. And this, the number of um, monks, nuns, and lay practitioners and residents reached about 10,000. And then in 2001, uh, a government work team demolished many of these residences. Um, from 2001 until 2016, the population perhaps reached as many as 20,000. And this led uh, yet another government work team to come in and demolish a good portion of these residences. So the scale, the, the government keeps um, trying to limit the, the growth of this institution. Um, just to give you a little more historical background, um, so in the 1980s, you start to see the rebuilding of many of uh, the temples and monasteries that were demolished during the Cultural Revolution. Another key part of this story is tourism. Um, so in the, in the 90s, um, lots of tourists traveling to Tibetan re regions, especially tourists from, um, from foreign countries, but also from Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Macau. And if you go to Tibetan monasteries back then, it would be rare to see mainland Chinese um, making offerings at temples or, or um, meeting with high-ranking lamas. But as domestic tourism starts to take off, um, you find more and more domestic Chinese tourists traveling to Tibetan areas. You also have the spread of a lot of Buddhist material online, websites, chat forums devoted to Tibetan Buddhism. Um, and also, I think another important element of this is that you have several prominent Hong Kong pop stars and Taiw Taiwanese pop stars as well who are very visible in their, um, uh, you know, their devotion to Tibetan Buddhism. So people like Wang Fei, the singer Wang Fei in particular, um, I think had a lot of influence on um, mainland Chinese. So I mentioned the, the restaurants where they gather. Um, this is a ex restaurant that I went to with um, other with Buddhists many times in Chengdu. Uh, Chinese name is Wei Gun, English it's vegan. Um, I got the distinct sense that the the Tibetan lamas who were brought to this restaurant were not a big fan of the cuisine, um, but um, and you can see the you know the interior. Um, as a kind of direct mimicry of um, you know, temple iconography and architecture. Uh, you've got Tibetan prayer wheels lining the stairs. There's videos playing of Buddhist sermons. Um, there's free Buddhist literature being distributed. So let me say a little bit more about practitioner communities, and then I'll move on to talk about the gendered aspects of this phenomenon. 
So one thing I was interested in, my previous re research looked a lot at the kind of after work socializing engaged in by business people. And, and now that many of them had become Buddhists, I was interested in how refraining from, from alcohol and meat eating, um, smoking, etc., was, was affecting their business and uh, their business and, and careers. So one successful Buddhist salesman explained to me that he no longer engaged in the masculine carousing that typically accompanies business deals in China out of fear of the potential karmic consequences. As an example, he, he explained, quote, what if I hire a prostitute for my client and he gets her pregnant and then she has an abortion? I would bear the karmic cost. He went on to explain that not participating in vice-heavy forms of ying cho or th this ritualized entertaining has not hurt his business. In fact, he claims that his business has improved because his clients and partners know that he, quote unquote, has beliefs. And they assume that his beliefs render him less likely to cheat or take advantage of them. Some practitioners were able to use their community of shushong, or fellow disciples, to expand their business and professional networks in ways that were financially beneficial. Buddhist government officials and civil servants, however, explained that they took measures to hide their beliefs from their co-workers and claim that their unwillingness to participate in frequent entertaining with their co-workers or engage in bribery held back their careers. So let me turn now to the gender dimension of this phenomenon. So reliable while reliable statistics specifically focused on Tibetan Buddhism and the PRC are hard to come by, I would estimate that around 70% of Han Chinese lay practitioners of Tibetan Buddhism are women. And this was the number given to me by most devotees I interviewed and Tibetan lamas with whom I spoke as well. And it also seemed to be confirmed by the demographics of the events I attended. Women followers ranged from college-age single women to married women in their early 60s. Another generalization one can make about the Tibetan Buddhist community is that it is urban, well-educated, and relatively affluent. Besides encountering Tibetan Buddhism as, as tourists on trips to Tibet and other Tibetan regions, many learn about it online or by reading po popular lay Buddhist texts, some of which are Chinese translations of popular Buddhist books originally published in the West. Others are introduced to Tibetan Buddhism through friends who bring them to the frequent empowerment ceremonies that are held informally in major Chinese cities. The reasons women are more drawn to Tibetan Buddhism and to religious practice in general in China are too complex for me to fully address here, but let me highlight a few issues. The first is that religious belief in general is viewed as more socially acceptable for women since it generates fewer contradictions with their normative life course. As one female practitioner explained to me, quote, if you're a man and you start to practice Buddhism, people will think you're avoiding a part of your responsibility to society to earn money. They'll think you've become passive and are just looking for a way of escaping reality. But if you're a woman, there's a way in which Buddhist beliefs are aligned with traditional expectations around women to be virtuous, kind, and self-sacrificing. The word she used was xian hui. Most people, and especially their husbands, think it's a good thing. At least if you have beliefs, you're not out and about spending money, playing around, and being wild." Unquote. She contrasted this, however, with the few male followers she knew, who often hid their beliefs from their employers for fear that it would hurt their career advancement. A male middle-aged civil servant and Communist Party member I came to know well claimed that his widely known belief in Buddhism prevented his advancement at the government agency where he worked. Another young male practitioner from Beijing I interviewed explains that parents typically have an unmarried daughter's Buddhist beliefs, but are likely to strongly object if their unmarried son starts practicing Buddhism as they believe this will damage his marriage prospects. He explained it's widely perceived that a man who has strong religious beliefs will be seen as lacking the ability to navigate a morally compromised society and, there, and thereby make money to support a family. While many of the practitioners I met were married, single and divorced women were very common. For them in particular, Tibetan Buddhism provided a form of social critique of the dominant values and pursuits of mainstream society. One unmarried female practitioner in her early 30s explained that because society favors youth and beauty, women who are past their prime age, their prime marriage age of 25, I know it's an advanced age, often feel a sense of crisis. Their parents and others around them are all putting intense pressure on them to get married in order to achieve normative femininity. She explained that older married women face a different pre predicament. 
Once they've fulfilled their duties to society to marry and raise a child, they often feel abandoned or overly dependent on husbands who are focused on their careers and frequently engaged in extramarital relationships with younger women. Tibetan Buddhism, she asserted, offers both groups of women a spiritual crutch, ji tuo, a way of understanding their predicaments and an alternative set of values and practices around which to orient their lives. For many of the devotees I came to know, Buddhist principles help them account for personal or financial difficulties. This included both men, uh, women and men who were divorced or who had dealt with serious illness or the death of a close family member. They ref referenced the doctrine of karmic cause and effect, yinguo, to account for the injustices and misfortunes they encountered. The principle of karma also offered them assurance that the immorality and greed of others, which all too often seemed to go unpunished in contemporary China, would eventually result in profound karmic consequences. Another young unmarried devotee explained that she was drawn to Tibetan Buddhism because it helped explain the unfairness around her. Why others with less ability and drive than her succeeded and why men were attracted to women she viewed as bad. She explained that before she studied Buddhism, she often felt conflicted about the right way to act. The advice her parents gave her didn't seem to be an effective template for succeeding in China, especially when the dishonest or immoral course of action seemed to produce the best results. Buddhism, she explained, finally gave her a clear sense of right and wrong and clarified for her what truly mattered and what was worth pursuing in life. And she said her previous goal was to marry a handsome man who would buy her lots of expensive clothes. And this was a goal she had now abandoned. As I described above, followers of Tibetan Buddhism form close-knit communities around their Tibetan teachers. But these Tibetan gurus were rarely seen in person by their followers. Chinese followers who donated significant amounts of money, who possessed special skills such as web design and accounting, uh, or who provided apartments that could serve as, as the site of study sessions or ritual practice, often had significantly more access to their teachers, which was sometimes resented by other followers. Some Tibetan lamas don't speak fluent Chinese, although many the two uh, lamas I mentioned previously uh, both speak very fluent Chinese. Since most uh, lamas don't speak fluent Chinese, and since it is extremely rare for Chinese practitioners to speak Tibetan, they often communicate with their Chinese disciples through translators of varying quality. When they did ha have contact with each other, Han Chinese followers sometimes treated their Tibetan teachers as their therapists, seeking advice about complex marital, familial, and financial problems from celibate monks who had grown up in monasteries. And I, had, I witnessed this um, firsthand when I spent the night in a, in a Tibetan monastery. And the monks in the room next to mine were answering their cell phones late into the night, uh, answering questions about, about business, about children's studies, about marital problems, about just about everything. Um, so they really were put in the position of therapists, I thought. One Tibetan doctor who frequently treated Han-affiliated lamas explained to me that many Tibetan lamas felt torn by the needs of their Han followers, which often pulled them away and alienated them from the Tibetan communities they would traditionally serve. While they felt an obligation to ease the suffering expressed by their Han disciples, many lamas felt ill-equipped to manage the unf unfamiliar and often persistent demands of their Han students. Followers who made large donations in particular often felt that this gave them special access and the right to ask for initiations and transmissions of teachings not available to all disciples. Occasionally, according to a few Tibetan monks I spoke with, this resulted in monks transmitting teachings they were unauthorized or lacked the training to make. And this was a, um, something that many Tibetan monks and lamas that I spoke with were very anxious about, that, that the, this, the large amount of money coming from Han students was going to lead to a kind of um, them, them to make transmissions of teachings or perform initiations or, or not to really to offer teachings to students who weren't ready to receive them. And this would be, rather than helping them in their path of study, this would, could lead to severe consequences, negative consequences. While wealthy patrons or disciples who served their teacher in a specific role were often granted special access, most practitioners rarely saw or communicated directly with their teacher. Thus, those who had been studying the longest tended to be the main resource for questions surrounding proper practice and doctrine. These questions about proper practice, which included issues such as vegetarianism, reciting of sutras and mantras, 
and function, the release of captive animals, were also the most common sources of dispute. A common complaint in my conversations with followers was the do dogmatic strictness of many Han lay practitioners who obsessed over the karmic implication of every detail of their daily lives and especially every interaction with their guru. One devotee, after studying diligently for several years and donating more than half of her quite substantial annual salary to her teacher, made a conscious decision to scale back on her studying and ritual practice. She complained that too many of the practitioners around her were obsessing over the form and ignoring the content of Buddhism. She exclaimed, quote, even monks don't have so many rules. Another lay practitioner explained to me as we were drinking tea, lifting up an elaborately decorated teacup, quote, they think that Buddhism is the cup. It's and they argue over what it should look like or what color it should be. But Buddhism is what's inside the cup. It's the water. It doesn't matter what kind of cup you put it in. The water is the same. Approximately half of Han Chinese who identify as Tibetan Buddhism take part in formal Buddhist classes organized by the Bodhi Society, Puti Shri Hui, founded by Kempo Sodarge Rinpoche. So this was the, the Lama that I showed uh, a slide of previously. These classes are free and open to anyone who registers for them and require several hours a week of rigorous study, including regular tests. Typically, they are taught by other lay practitioners who successfully completed advanced level classes. The Chinese translations of Tibetan Buddhist texts used in these classes and vid videos of Kempo Sodarge's sermons posted online have become the authoritative materials for Buddhist study for many other Chinese speaking followers as well, including those not formally enrolled in these classes. These study groups, known as Puti Xiaozu, are common in most major Chinese cities and have a huge presence online in the form of websites and WeChat groups. Buddhist practitioners who studied on their own or with the aid of a teacher sometimes complained about the Puti Xiaozu, who they found to be overly judgmental, strict, and insular. Among these practitioners of Tibetan Buddhism, this milieu of a cynical post-belief society often comes to frame these disputes between followers. Followers tend to view the <coughs> Excuse me. Factions among followers tend to view themselves as true believers and dismiss others as merely looking to profit, either materially or spiritually, from their engagement with Buddhism. When talking with Buddhist devotees, I frequently describe to them my previous research with wealthy entrepreneurs and how their, the growing interest in Tibetan Buddhism among this group led me to my current project. Almost universally, the followers I met with were dismissive of this group and their patronage of Tibetan Buddhism, such as the, the, the bosses who buy the, the luxury SUVs for the Lamas. They frequently recounted the perhaps apocryphal tale of a wealthy businessman who attempts to make a large cash offering to a Tibetan Lama he happens to sit next to on a plane in the hope that it will solidify the business deal he's on his way to make. And this, this story, I heard this story repeated many times. Um, and the story ends with the Lama refusing to take money from this businessman. One longtime practitioner criticized these phenomena as, quote, trying to do business with Sakyamuni, and thus merely an extension of the calculating amoral ethos that permeates Chinese society into Buddhism. Others replicated the official distinction between religion, zongjiao, and superstition, mixin dismissing the ostentatious offerings of wealthy bosses as mere superstition rather than religion. Another lay practitioner divided the different Han followers into different factions. The face group, the Mianzi group, who he said were simply following the fad of Tibetan Buddhism. The superstition group, like the bosses I mentioned previously, who want to benefit from Tibetan Buddhism. And then finally, the true practitioners group, or the Xiuxin group, who he, saw, who he included himself in that group. Yet the status of someone who practiced well and truly believed seemed like a constantly receding horizon, with some devotees asserting that even the lamas wandering around big Chinese cities can't compare with the ascetic monks living in caves. So this brings me to my final section on controversy surrounding so-called fake lamas and the scandal surrounding the actor uh, Zhang Tevin. So perhaps the phenomenon that has attracted the most attention around the recent spread of Tibetan Buddhism into Han areas 
has been the rise of so-called fake living Buddhas, jia huo fu, who pretend to be reincarnated lamas in order to profit from their followers' donations or to use their position to seduce female followers, claiming that certain sexual activities are part of tantric practice. The most famous is the 2015 ordination ceremony of the well-known Chinese actor Zhang Tilin, famous for playing emperors and generating scandals involving his ex-lovers and illegitimate children. The ordination of Zhang Tilin as a reincarnate lama was administered by a Han Chinese man from Fujian named Wu Darong. So this is uh, in the center there is Zhang Tilin, and then the person who ordained him as a living Buddha is in yellow there. Um, a Han Chinese man who claimed to be the living Buddha, uh, Bai Mao Ao Se. Um, so during his speech at the ceremony, and this is, you can find this online, I encourage you if you're interested to have a look at it because it's a quite rich uh, cultural text. So during his speech at the ceremony, Zhang Lin states, quote, before I became a disciple of living Buddha, referring to Bai Mao Ao Se, I had a big ego, a great one. I played more than 50 Chinese emperors and I felt I was greater than heaven. But since I met him and became his disciple, I feel that the sky and earth have become much more vast, and the living Buddha is so great that I feel dwarfed. My life is now filled with hope." Unquote. So when video of this ceremony was posted online, it generated considerable outrage, both among Tibetan and Chinese Buddhists. Netizens analyzed the ceremony and found that it contained an incoherent jumble of ritual objects and ceremonies from several different sects of Tibetan Buddhism and from Chinese imperial court ritual. The scandal it generated led to an investigation into Bai Mao Ao Se's background, and it turned out that he was never in fact ordained by the Tibetan monastery he claimed had recognized him as a reincarnated lama. And he was in fact a shareholder in several businesses posing as Buddhist charities. Shortly after, his incident, after this incident, um, so here's another screenshot of uh, Zhang Tailin after he's ordained. Shortly after this incident, and partly in response to it, the State Administration for Religious Affairs announced that it had set up an online database for authenticating living Buddhas in which users can enter the name of any living Buddha they encountered. And so here's a screenshot of the website. Um, so it's the uh, the Huofo Zixun Xitong, so the, uh, an online system for checking on living Buddhas. Um, so users of this site uh, must enter uh, their mobile numbers to gain access. And for reasons that I can't figure out, you're limited to five inquiries a day. So this site is no doubt linked to recent efforts by the CCP to control the process of reincarnation by specifying which lamas are allowed to reincarnate and which are not and determining which reincarnations are legitimate. In addition to keeping a database of lineages of reincarnated lamas, in 2007, the State Administration of Religious Affairs implemented the methods for managing the reincarnation of Tibetan Buddhist living Buddhas, which requires local Buddhist associations under the auspices of the provincial government to issue a, li a living Buddha certificate, a huofo zheng shu, to recognize reincarnated lamas. However, Rumors are widespread that these certificates can be easily obtained with a bribe, and that officials distribute them to personally or politically favored monks, and to even non-monks, such as Bai Mao Ao Se. And so um, the, the man who ordained uh, Zhang Tianlin wasn't, didn't, wasn't in possession of one of these certificates, but he did have close ties to the, the state, uh, admit, the Religious Affairs Bureau. Interestingly, these scandals involving fake lamas have for the most part not served to discredit or undermine Tibetan Buddhism as a source of moral authority among Han followers. Practitioners instead tend to blame the party state for their corrupt handling of reincarnation, presuming cynical uh, machinations for control are what really underlie their attempts to protect followers from being duped. Ironically, this has led many Han followers to pay closer attention to the status of their teachers among Tibetans who many Chinese view as the ultimate arbiters of spiritual authenticity. The practitioners I knew were less concerned that they would be duped by a fake lama than that they would become the follower of one with a reputation that had been inflated by his Han followers and who lack respect among Tibetans. And there's some um, instances of uh, lamas who don't have much status in Tibetan communities attracting large Han followings and having, I even heard a story of a lama who, um, 
was returning to his home monastery with a group of Han followers. And it was rumored, at least, that he had to pay uh, a group of local Tibetans to, to do prostrations for him as he entered uh, to sort of show their, to fake their respect for him. The massive amount of donations flowing to Tibetan lamas and monasteries from wealthy Chinese, however, has started to bring the problems of urban China to monastic communities. As one Tibetan complained to me, quote, Lamas used to talk about how they suffered during the Cultural Revolution. Now they sit around comparing who has the most Chinese followers. Monastic hierarchies have sometimes been threatened by lower ranking monks who managed to attract large, Han, Han, large numbers of Han students. The Tibetan doctor I interviewed explained that she was treating growing numbers of Tibetan monks for diabetes and gout uh, brought on by their constant banquets with Han disciples. Sites of Tibetan monks being chauffeured around in luxury SUVs or dining at expensive restaurants with their Chinese followers are frequently interpreted by non-Buddhists as evidence of the growing corruption of Tibetan Buddhism. However, the luxury apartments and cars of gurus rarely seem to bother the practitioners with whom I conducted my research. Instead, they interpreted them as material evidence of the cosmic power and efficacy of their teachers. As long as the charisma of their gurus is validated by believing Tibetan disciples, Chinese followers were assured that their offerings generate authentic merit, authentic value in the form of karmic merit. And so this brings me uh, to my conclusion. Much of the appeal of Tibetan Buddhism to many Han Chinese is no doubt informed by their stereotypes about Tibetans, who because of their supposed incomplete modernization and development have yet to be fully indoctrinated into a cynical market individualism, and therefore are presumed, at least, to still have authentic beliefs. It is thus worth emphasizing that Chinese Buddhists are not simply striving to appropriate the qualities they project upon Tibetans, qualities which typically include being constitutionally happy, smiling, and worry-free, but also their status as believers. For many Chinese devotees, their newfound moral practice does not necessarily consist of significant revisions to their personal, familial, or career lives. Rather, it primarily consists of patronage to their guru, making financial contributions, or gongyang, which support their teachers' sometimes luxurious livelihoods, their home monasteries, and their charitable work. Regardless of whether or not they themselves believe, wealthy Buddhist devotees seem to take profound comfort in the belief of others, which they support with cash contributions which they sometimes ironically refer to as spiritual protection money, or jingshen bahu fei. Returning to the themes at the beginning of this paper, the moral authority of Tibetan Buddhism and the status of Tibet as the locus of belief is largely informed by official CCP depictions and popular stereotypes of Tibetans as pre-modern spiritual, naive, and anti-materialistic. Among Han Chinese followers, however, the valences of these terms are inverted. Rather than being indicative of, indicative of Tibetans' backwardness and savagery, these qualities grant them the authority to provide moral and spiritual guidance. While these stereotypes still seem to inform the interactions of many of the Han followers, uh, of many Han followers with their Tibetan teachers, perhaps locking Tibetans into yet another prisoner of Shangri-La, prison of Shangri-La. Sorry, there is potential that this dynamic will gradually transform over time. Their experiences traveling in Tibetan regions and visiting Tibetan monasteries has brought many urban Chinese into close proximity to Tibetan communities and greater awareness of, and sometimes direct experience of, state control of Tibetan religious life. Many now quite see, quite clearly, see quite clearly the discrepancy between official representation and Tibetan realities. Whether this will generate shifts in their thinking about the status of Tibet is, of course, the big question. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.